Hey, how is everybody doing out there this morning? I hear an echo. Thank you for being here. As you're staying into your feet, uh, we just want to welcome you in. If this is your first time being here, thank you for choosing Shelby Christian Church. And I also want to remind you tonight at 6 p.m., we're having our first worship night of the year. So if you want to come and just, you know, listen to the music, if you want to sing, if you want to praise the Lord, if you want to pray, whatever it is, we want you to be here tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, but we're just going to invite the Lord into this place today. I don't, I don't know how your week's been. I don't know how your month's been or your year's been. But if it's been like me, you just need a little bit of something today because um, just, a, just real quick, I have been a little ill over the last month or so, and I found myself not being able to sing. Has anybody ever had laryngitis? This is the first time in my life, I think, that I've ever had laryngitis. But I recognized one thing, is that whenever I couldn't sing, I really wanted to sing, and I didn't realize how much I sang throughout the week and just wanted to praise God. But hey, God's good. I'm starting to get on the men, and we're ready to sing this morning. You ready to sing this morning? Look to your neighbor and say, are you ready to sing this morning? All right, let's go. Go on, put your hands together. The Word of God says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's what we're going to do this morning. Yeah. Praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. Yeah. I praise when I'm short. And praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm outnumbered. And praise when surrounded. My praise is the waters, my enemies drowned in. As long as I breathe it, I've got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul. Praise the Lord of my soul. And I praise when I feel it. Praise when I don't, yeah. You've been there. I praise cause I know he's still in control, yeah. My praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound. And praise is a shout that breaks Jericho down. As long as we're breathing, as long as I'm breathing, I
remember those walls that we call sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we call death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now Come on, this is our God And this is our God, this is who he is He loves us And this is our God this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness And never once did he fail good Amen. all the time and all the time good. Amen the world wants to distract us he wants to take all the glory from the one true king but Jesus is still Lord and we needed to keep our eyes on him and not be like Peter when he wanted to get out of the boat. And he watched all the waves around him. He started to sink. But he had to keep his eyes on Jesus. Amen. And I love the old song that goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Yeah. 
in the light of his glory and grace. Sing it again. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange. things of earth and the things of earth will grow strange beating in the light of his glory and grace
all over this room. We just want to just vocally just say how much we love you, God, and how much we are appreciative, thankful for what you're doing, for the things that, Lord, that you are creating and bringing life to, the things that in our lives that we have to crucify and get rid of, God, thank you for allowing us to see that with the eyes that you give us spiritually, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for doing an amazing work today, God. Thank you for the word. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Let me see. Good morning, church. I'm Bobby Woods, discipleship pastor here. In case you don't know me, this is the last sermon in our series on marriage. And it's let's stay married. So I'm going to start off this morning. I want to recognize the couple that's been married the longest in the room. If you've been married more than 50 years, raise your hand. Okay, 55 years. 60 years. 62 years. 64 years. Okay, 63 years. Okay, there we go. Over here, Brett. <laughs> I got another one over here, 63, 63, awesome. You're lucky I got more than one gift card. That's awesome, that's awesome. <laughs> Attending a wedding for the first time, a little girl whispered to her mother, why is the bride wearing white? Her mother said, because white is the color of happiness and today is the happiest day of her life. And the little girl thought for about this for a minute and then asked, then why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> Have you ever tried to build one of those thousand piece puzzles? And what do you do? You usually take and you try and find all the end pieces first. So you can make the round part. And then you just try and find any piece that goes together. I once put a 1,000 piece puzzle together that was nothing but white. It took almost forever. The problem is my people would just give up on something like that. And this is because when it puts, comes to putting puzzles together, it's much easier to start than to finish. Many tasks in life are like that. It's easier to start a marathon than it is to cross the finish line. It's easier to get a mortgage than it is to pay one off, right? And this principle is especially true for marriage. Marriages are relatively easy to start but very difficult to finish. The sad fact is that many brides and grooms treat their marriages like we treat jigsaw puzzles. I mean, they lay out the border pieces. That they work very hard to make their ceremony right. They spend a fortune on beautiful flowers and great music and fabulous dresses and tucks. And they find a nice home and enjoy the fun of furnishing it and setting up housekeeping. But as the months and the years go by and as the task of marriage becomes more and more puzzling, they give up. They never finish what they started. They never complete the beautiful, lifelong picture of love God intended their marriages to be. And because of this, as you no doubt know, the statistics on the Institute of Marriage don't look very good these days. We live in a nation where 60% of new marriages end in divorce. Did you know in Florida you can actually do a drive-through divorce? How convenient. <laughs> Now, why is this so? Why do so many brides and grooms give up on their marriages? The first thing is, I think people go into marriage with unrealistic expectations. For example, they expect their marriage to make them happy. 
Now, for some reason, this is like a universally accepted notion that a quick wall walk down the center aisle will usher a person into the halls of human happiness and bliss when in reality it might or it might not. Marriage does not ensure happiness. A man walked into a mental institution one day and was taking a tour. And the tour guide took him by a man who was in his cell and he's just beating his head against the padded walls. He kept saying, Julia, how could you do it? Julia, how could you do it? The guide explained that the man was in love with Julia and when Julia jilted him, he couldn't handle it. And then he went on down the hall and he came to another cell and there's another man beating his head against the wall and he's saying, Julia, Julia, how could this happen? Julia, Julia. Visitor said, well, who's he? The guide explained, well, he's the man that married Julia. <laughs> Marriage is not the secret to happiness in life. In fact, it's selfish to go into marriage for that purpose. We should marry with the idea that our goal is to make our future house, I mean, spouse happy. Number two, we must learn to think of marriage as a permanent relationship. Now, this may seem pretty obvious tenet for making marriage last, but you see, many people in our culture no longer look at marriage that way. 60 years ago in America, divorce was considered a tragedy. It was an embarrassment. Divorced people would do anything to avoid their talking about their marital status. But today, many people readily, almost proudly admit that they've been divorced not just once or twice, but four or four times. Charles Swindoll tells of seeing a sign in a Hollywood jeweler window that said, we rent wedding rings. <laughs> now, I want you to understand that I'm not preaching to those of you that have been divorced, I'm not trying to rub salt into your wounds, and I hope you know that God can, can and will forgive any sin or failure and help us start a new life. No, I'm trying to talk to you this morning who have been married or believe that one day you might get married because it is you who must realize that one of the greatest causes of today's high divorce rate is that couples enter it thinking it's only temporary. In fact, the whole concept of establishing a permanent bond between a husband and wife is quickly becoming a foreign thought. Till death do his part, unfortunately, is just a mere for verbal formality to many newlyweds. More and more it's being interpreted till disagreements do us part, till interests do us part. And this has to stop because no marriage can last if there is always the option of quitting when things get tough. We're starting this morning by looking at Genesis chapter two. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to man. At last! The man exclaimed. This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. And now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. A five-year-old went to church one morning, came home and told his parents about how this great story he'd heard about Adam and Eve and how Adam, you know, Eve had been taken from Ad, Adam's ribs. And a few days later, he went up to his mom and he said, Mom, my side hurts. I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> Husbands and wives leave their families to join one another. The Hebrew word for join means to glue or to cling in a permanent sense. This is the way marriage was intended to work. God designed it into a long life union between one man and one woman. And if a marriage is to succeed, brides and grooms must embrace this principle at the onset. Slats Grobick sold Christmas trees in New York. 
And you notice one time a couple had come to hunt for a Christmas tree. The guy was really skinny with a big Adam's apple, and she was kind of pretty. But both wore clothes from the bottom of the bin from Goodwill. After bypassing trees that were too expensive, they found a scotch pine that was great on one side, but pretty bare on the other. Then they picked up another tree that was about the same way, full on one side and scraggly on the other. And so she whispered something and he asked if $3 would be okay. Slats figured both trees wouldn't sell anyway, so he agreed. A few days later, Slats was walking down the street and saw this beautiful tree in the couple's apartment. He was thick and well-rounded. He knocked on their door and he told them, How'd you get this tree? He says, oh, those are the two trees you showed us. We just shoved them together and tied the trunks together. The branches overlapped and formed a tree so thick you couldn't see the wire. Slats described it as a tiny forest of its own. You take two trees that aren't perfect, that have flaws, that might be homely, that might maybe nobody else would want, If you put them together just right, you can come up with something really beautiful. From day one and every day after, husbands and wives must maintain the attitude that I'm in this marriage for keeps, never ever entertaining the thought of quitting. In marriage, you have to make a lifelong commitment and you must do whatever it takes to carry through. During England's darkest days in the 1930s and 40s during World War II, it was the pudgy, cigar-smoking, unimpressive-looking man who held the country together. While other voices were shouting surrender, Sir Winston Churchill stood fast. He said, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. While bombs devastated city blocks, buildings crumbled, bridges fell, but the stubborn prime minister refused to budge. Never once did he consider capitulating or even negotiating with the Nazis. He ordered on this rather simple rule of thumb when it came to winning a war. Wars are not won by evacuations and surrender. And he was right. Surrendering should not be an option if you plan to win a war or if you plan to succeed in marriage. I agree with an attorney. He said there are two processes that should never be started prematurely. Embalming and divorce. Number three, we need to correct each other with humility. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, how my wife responds to my sins has a disappropriate effect on how I see myself and my own sin, and vice versa. As spouses, we sit at a critical, sensitive, and sometimes painful window into each other's souls. The question is how we will handle that burden and privilege. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. How different our marriages would be if we just simply and consistently implemented these verses. The longer we stare at any given speck, months, years, even decades, the harder it can become to see our own logs. In the vulnerability of marriage, it is all the more important to confront and to correct each other with humility with a patient awareness of our own failures and in a resilient hopefulness for change and growth. A husband and a wife were one day fussing. They really got at it. So the wife suggested that they write down their complaints on a piece of paper, then show the other person exactly how they felt. She thought it might cut down on their fight. So the husband agreed, he got the paper, she got the pencils, and they both sat down and started writing. They both wrote furiously for a little while. The husband would pause, look at his wife, and then would write some more. 
The wife would pause, look at her husband, and then write some more. The husband paused again, looked at his wife with an even angrier look on his face, and he wrote down some more. The wife did the same, and she put her pencil down. But her husband was still writing. He looked up at her in fury and continued writing. He kept writing. Then he wrote some more. Then he even wrote more. And the wife was getting furious because she was covered on one side of her piece of paper and her husband was finishing up the second page. He kept looking up at her and coming up with more to write. Every time he looked up, something new would come and he'd write some more. His wife was in pain and agony. She was clenching her fists and tears of anger were glowing up in her eyes. But finally, her husband finished and put down his pencil. They exchanged pieces of paper and looked at each other's paper. As soon as she gave him her sheet and looked at his, she felt terrible. She wanted to take her sheet back. For when she looked at her husband's sheet of paper, in spite of his anger and in spite of his pain, he had written on every line, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm ticked off, but I love you. I'm angry, but I love you. I don't want to be here right now, but I love you. When she saw that much love, she forgot what they were even fighting about. When you and I love each other like that, that kind of love can cover a multitude of sins. Number four might seem a little obvious. Don't murder each other. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall become sons of God. Now we may assume, we assume that sexual immorality has ended more marriages than any other threat. And it surely has crushed and devoured many. But I wonder, however, if unchecked anger has ended more. Matthew 5 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Many of us are disturbed in our homes. Rather than being married by a justice of the peace, it looks like we've been married by a secretary of war. Jesus makes no room for unrighteous anger. He elevates it besides murder. And yet how often have we made room for it in our homes? How often have we felt justified while our hurt feelings burned hot within us? And how often have we responded to unrighteous anger with more unrighteous anger? By all means, guard your marriage bed from adultery and unfaithfulness, but also guard it from your own anger. You see, guarding against anger, and when a fire breaks out, don't leave it unaddressed. Like this couple that were going down a country road for several miles, not saying a word. Their earlier fight had just let them to the point where neither one would concede their position. As they passed by a barnyard full of mules and goats and pigs, the husband said sarcastically, relatives of yours? Yep. The wife said, yep, in-laws. <laughs> Number five, delight to forgive each other. Jesus said, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Do offenses con consistently get addressed in your relationships or not? Do you lovingly correct each other? Are you quick to admit when you're wrong or to confess when you have failed? Do you still gladly forgive each other? Couples who avoid hard conversations forfeit some of the sweetest moments in marriage. For Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Because every marriage is a union between sinners, forgiveness should be our constant guest. Children may come and go, jobs will come and go, houses will come and go, but the need for forgiveness will remain. So will forgiveness become a welcome and celebrated guest in your home or an unwelcome 
and resentful one. Jesus warns us, including wives and husbands, if you forgive others' trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others' trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Is there any relationship test our willingness to forgive and to preserve and to forgive like marriage? Jesus says an unwillingness to forgive is a spiritually lethal. Mercy, on the other hand, breeds security and joy. For Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Forgiveness is costly, and in some ways, all the more so in marriage. Marriage reveals more of us than we want to show, and it opens us up to more pain than most other relationships. And we inevitably must forgive the same sins again and again and again. In fact, Jesus said 70 times seven. That feels about right. It's good to remember that this love, as much as on any in the earth, it meant to look like the cross. So we shouldn't be surprised that sometimes it feels like we're carrying one in our marriages. In fact, that feeling may be proof that we're doing something right. Number six, brides and grooms must learn to love their spouse the way God loves them. You see, there's a stark difference in the kind of love that we show each other as couples and the way God's love for us. The typical love that sinful humans express to each other is a selfish love. It's oriented towards those that are loving rather than the one they're supposed to be receiving it. It's based on a feeling that is fueled by whether or not the other person is physically attractive or has a good personality or is treating you well. This human love is focused on what the other person does for you. Jesus described this kind of love in Luke 6. He said, if you love only those who love you, why should you credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And you do only to those who do good to you. Why should you get credit? Even the sinners do that much. The problem with this human caliper of love, it is not nearly strong enough to withstand the storms that plague any marriage because a selfish love is a weak love. That is human love, it says, as long as you stimulate me, as long as I can be proud of you, as long as you stay beautiful, I can love you. If you change, my feelings for you change as well. Now, divine love, God's love is different. Instead of being selfishly based on one loving, the lover, it is selflessly based on the one loved, the lovee. And the divine love involves not feeling but sacrificial action. It involves willfully focusing not on our needs, but on the needs of the other person. The wonderful truth is that when we commit to acting in love towards our spouse, we experience a depth of passion that is not found in any other way. A woman came to a divorce lawyer one day and said, I want a divorce. I really hate my husband and I want to hurt him. Give me some advice. In addition to wanting to get financial gain and give him the shaft, she was wondering about some other way she might do him in. The attorney said, look, you're going to divorce the guy anyway, so for the next three months, don't criticize him. Speak only well of him. Build him up. Every time he does something nice, commend him for it. Tell him what a great guy he is and do that for three months. And once he thinks that he has your confidence and love, hit him with the news. It'll hurt him more. The woman thought, I can't go wrong with this. I'm divorcing the guy anyway. Why should I speak badly about him anymore? I'm going to speak only well of him. So she complimented her husband for everything he did. And for three months, she told him what a great man he was. She acted lovingly toward him. And you know what happened in that relationship? After three months, she forgot about the divorce and they went on a second honeymoon. 
that shows one of the secrets to success in marriage is learning how not to be a selfish person. Learning to be spouse-centered instead of self-centered. And when both husband and wife obey scripture and submit to each other in center-focused, a beautiful relationship that is mutually beneficial to both is nourished. Now you must understand the other-centered way of living is something that's not possible to maintain unless you tap into the supernatural power of God. In his book, Marriage After God's Own Heart, David Clark says, on your own marriage is impossible. It's not really, really difficult, not just a tremendous challenge, it's impossible. Marriage is a never-ending series of conflicts, misunderstandings, and mind-boggling misconnections. He said, but now for the good news. Marriage is the one human relationship with the most potential for intimacy. Even with all our differences, marriage can work beautifully when we keep God at the center of our relationship. A little boy told his father in Sunday school class, he had learned about the time Jesus went to the wedding and made water into wine. And his dad asked him, well, what did you learn from that story? The boy thought for a moment and answered, I guess if you're going to have a wedding, make sure Jesus is there. That's good advice, isn't it? You see, a marriage in which God is part is more likely to be a lifelong one because spouses know that it is God's teaching. If a husband and wife each have a growing relationship with God, then they know the importance of valuing one another more highly than they value themselves, and they play by the same set of rules. So take care where you build your home. Matthew 7 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You notice most of the the verses we've used this morning have come from the Sermon on the Mount. And so after preaching and teaching on anger and lust and anxiety and integrity and vengeance and forgiveness and giving and fasting and praying and more, Jesus closes with a vivid picture of two kinds of homes, one built upon sand and the other built upon rock. Lives and marriages built on sand will fail. Lives and marriages built on the rock will stand for better or worse, for richer, for purer, in sickness and in health. In other words, whatever may come. For he said, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So what's it mean to have a marriage on, built on the rock? It means to build our marriages on obedience to Jesus. It means actively putting Jesus and his words at the center of our rhythms, our romance, and even our conflict. Are we still looking for creative ways to draw him further into our marriages? Maybe reading the Bible together, praying together, worshiping together, thanking him together, just enjoying Jesus together. Every marriage learns quickly that it takes a special spirit-filled intentionality to keep from drifting off the rock. You should also seek God before you seek each other. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You want the real key to happy and health, happy marriages? The real key, whether you are year one, year seven, uh, you're 60 something is to pursue something before and above marriage to pursue someone before and above your spouse blessed are the husbands and wives who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be faithful and hopeful and satisfied you see marriage was never meant to be a duet it was meant to be a holy trio between a man and a woman who love each other and the God whom they both serve. That is the way God set it up. He is to be the glue that holds every home together. And David said, 
Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. A husband and wife who leave God out of their relationship never really truly understands what love is between the two of them. In a family where both the husband and wife are both believers, where they read the Bible together and pray together, where they attend church together, in homes where God is real, there is a uniting force and a strengthening force which is absent in marriages where God is ignored. Brian Harbour says this, the greatest single cause of difficulty in the home today is a lack of spiritual concern. Either purposely or inadvertently, we leave God out of our marriages. Have you ever had to turn a lover over to a mortal enemy to allow her to find out for herself what his intentions toward her really are? Have you ever had to lie in bed knowing she was believing his lies and being intimate with him every night? Have you ever sat helplessly by in a parking lot while your enemies and his friends took turns taking advantage of your lover, even as you sat nearby, unable to win her heart so she could trust you to rescue her? Have you ever called this one you loved for so long and asked her if she was ready to come back to you only to have her say her heart was still captured by your enemy? Have you ever watched your lover's beauty slowly diminish and fade in the haze of alcohol and drugs and occult practices and infant sacrifice until she is no longer recognizable in body or soul? Have you ever loved on so much that you even sent your only son to talk to her about your love for her, knowing that she would kill him? All this and more, God has endured, yet he never stopped loving you. You see, the church is the bride of Christ. And in spite of all the sin, we continue to pile up. He never stops loving us. Today, you may realize that the tough times you have been going through with your spouse are because this statement applies to you. Are you leaving God out of your marriage? Are you leaving God out of your marriage? Do you spend time every day praying together, reading the Bible together, Worshiping once a week together? Are you leaving God out of your marriage? I would ask the worship team to go ahead and come out. If that's true, then you may need to respond to your spouse this morning and tell them, I want to finish what we started. I want to grow old with you. In our marriage, I want to experience the blessing God intended for it to be. I want God to be central in our relationship. Or you may be an individual who realizes that you have left God out of your own life personally. In these next few moments, we're going to move. If you want to experience true wholeness, if so, I'm going to invite you to come down this morning. If your marriage is in trouble, and you would not believe the amount of couples in our church that have marriages that are in trouble this morning, this should be a time that you two together should come. You should come and ask God to come back into your marriage to help you to do all these things we've talked about this morning. We're here to try and help you. And I pray that you listen. If this morning you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, then you don't even understand half of what I'm saying this morning. I pray this would be a time that you would move and come and get to know who Jesus is. All over the room, we have communion stations and the offering boxes there to give your tithes and offerings. And what I ask this morning is whatever God is laying upon your heart this morning, 
I pray that you go and you move and do what he calls. Let's stand together.
Jesus ultimately showed the love that a husband and wife should have to each other. That night he sat around the table and he took the Passover bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. So as often as we eat of it, remember him. Then he took the cup. He said, this is the covenant, the new covenant which is poured out for you. So as often as we drink of it, remember him. Hope you thought it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Awesome worship from the worship team. Um, the only parting thought I want to leave you with today is, if you've been married, let's say more than eight or nine years, then I really need you. I need more people that can be stand alongside other couples that are still struggling or they're just getting married. If you could just spend one evening a month having dinner with another couple, then please tell me, because I really need more and more mentors to help with some of these couples. I've got more people that need to be mentored than I have mentors to mentor them. So please pray about that. Give it some thought. One night a month is all it would take. Well, hope you all have a good night. Go love God, go love people, and watch Him change the world. Have a great day.